Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and recently one of our fans, Timothy Butler, sent me a question on our Facebook asking what would have happened had Obi-Wan Kenobi not found the clone army? Well, that's a great question, Timothy, and if you guys have a question like that, please like and follow us on Facebook and send us a message. So if you think about it, Obi-Wan Kenobi stumbling upon the clone army was a complete accident. Something that not even Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious could have planned for. It all started when the Military Creation Act was put forward in the Galactic Senate as a response to the growing unrest in the Outer Rim and the Separatist Crisis. Former Jedi Master Count Dooku had created the secessionist government known as the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The Outer Rim corporations had steadily increased the size and power of their own security forces. And the Stark Hyperspace War of 44 BBY showed that the Republic was woefully unprepared for large-scale military conflict. The Republic had not had a standing army in almost a thousand years, and so there was a lot of opposition against the Military Creation Act. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine remained neutral about this plan in the public sphere, but allowed proxies to fight for the act on his behalf in secret. Senator Padme Amidala was an opponent to the Military Creation Act, and she was actively campaigning against it in the Mid-Rim. This was why she was targeted for assassination. Officially speaking, it was Count Dooku who hired Jango Fett, who then had Zam Wessel plant a bomb on Padme Amidala's Nubian diplomatic yacht. After that first attempt failed, Wessel would try to use the poisonous cocoons to kill the senator while she slept. This time around, Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi and his apprentice Anakin Skywalker were around to save Padme and pursue the bounty hunter. But before the Jedi could get any information from Wessel, Jango Fett ends her life with a poisonous saber dart a saber dart that Kenobi would eventually track to Kamino using his contacts. Kamino was an extremely hard planet to find, and had Obi-Wan Kenobi not had a contact who knew about the planets, it would have been nearly impossible for him to travel there, because Count Dooku had erased all records of the planet from the Jedi archives. When Obi-Wan Kenobi arrives on Kamino, he's immediately taken to see the Prime Minister, and is briefed about the creation of the Clone Army. It seems like the Kaminoans had been waiting for the Jedi all this time, and were relieved that he was here to pick up their shipment. After all, they had 200,000 units finished and another million on the way. Now, had Obi-Wan Kenobi never stumbled upon the Kaminoan cloners, the first major change is that he most likely wouldn't have met Jango Fett and followed him to the world of Geonosis and uncovered the droid foundries there prepping for war. Which actually means that Obi-Wan Kenobi found not one secret army, but two on that day. Obi-Wan Kenobi is captured by the Separatist forces, which leads to Anakin and Padme carrying out a failed rescue attempt, which leads to the emergency powers being issued to the Chancellor of the Republic, who then activates the clone army, starting the Battle of Geonosis. Probably a bit earlier than Palpatine had initially planned on doing. Count Dooku was still in the process of having major corporate powers sign the Geonosian Accords, which marked the official founding of the Confederacy of Independent Systems after Dooku had formed its foundation two years earlier. This was the conversation that Obi-Wan Kenobi had witnessed. We see the various corpo heads pledge their allegiance to the CIS cause. This includes bringing their assets, resources, and security forces into play as well. This brought a real legitimacy to the CIS now that they had some serious financial backing along with military power. The reality is the more time the Separatist Alliance have to maneuver and build up their power base, the bigger of a threat they will become to the Republic. Aside from the Geonosian Accord, Separatist envoys were taking advantage of regional disputes and civil wars in the Outer Rim, like the ones that were occurring on planets like Onderon, Harun Kal, and Mon Kala, to just name a few. Now, up until this point, the Republic kept most of its member states in line through economic sanctions and trade regulations. If a world stepped out of line, they were sanctioned and access to Republic trade was cut off. The Republic never really had to use the threat of military force to enforce its will on other worlds. The Confederacy of Independent Systems, however, was backed by major corporations who in the last hundred years or so have shifted the power balance between the core regions and the outer territories. The cost of doing business in the free trade zone was significantly lower than the more populated sectors of the galaxy. And so manufacturing left Corellia, Coruscant, and traveled to techno union factories whose cheap goods were transported all across the galaxy by the Trade Federation's massive fleet. All of this came from funding from the intergalactic banking clans. And so for the first time in a really long time, there was a separate economic system that stood apart from the Republic one and was a lot less stagnant and restrictive. 
This new economic system was paired with a new political system, which included more direct representation within the Confederate Senate, new trade partners and markets, and of course the security provided by the separate destroyed army. So instead of having one large battle like Geonosis kick off the Clone Wars, I believe this version of the Clone Wars will start off with small proxy wars and skirmishes. As we mentioned before, there were several worlds already under a lot of domestic tension and on the brink of civil war. The Separatist Alliance can easily pour fuel on those fires by providing training, weapons, and even troops to these smaller conflicts, turning them into much larger conflicts. The Republic and the Jedi will have no choice but to respond, but without the creation of the Clone Army, they'll have to mainly rely on judicial forces and local planetary defense forces. As the fighting gets more intense, the Jedi will most likely uncover the fact that the Separatist Alliance are backing these uh, regional disputes in one way or another. This will raise an alarm in the Republic Senate, which will be important for the military creation act debate. But with Padme Amidala back in Coruscant because Obi-Wan Kenobi has not stumbled upon the clone army, the anti-military creation act faction will have one of their most powerful voices back in play. Better yet, that means junior Senator Banks won't be able to give Supreme Chancellor Palpatine emergency powers. Now, if Count Dooku can play his cards right, he can just claim that no Separatist forces are actually engaged in the civil wars. He can claim instead that he just sold or gifted battle droids to a faction who rightly is fighting against tyranny and oppression from the existing Republic-backed government. This could be seen as a complete legitimate claim and not an active open war, just like those uh, Russian mercenaries in Ukraine who clearly are not Russian soldiers. The reason the Battle of Geonosis started is the fact that the Separatists had Jedi hostages. Because the Republic lacked a military, the Jedi were essentially the only ones who could really defend the Republic. So any attempt to kidnap or kill the Jedi had to be met with swift and overly aggressive response. If you destroy this invincible image of the Jedi as Guardians of the Galaxy, then you're going to have a lot more problems and a lot more criminals and factions willing to fight against the Republic. This is why the Republic had to act, but if it's just the less important Outer Rim planet, which is in the midst of a planetary dispute or civil war, it'll be a lot harder to gather enough support within the Senate to react to such things. Especially because no one really knows how large the Separatist military is at this point. Remember, when Obi-Wan Kenobi stumbles upon the foundries of Geonosis, he witnesses an army of millions of droids, which created a very credible threat. In our timeline, it'll actually take the Republic a considerable amount of time to kind of research how large Count Dooku's military force actually is. This will buy the Republic and Separatists some time before open war ensues. We also have to remember that the Trade Federation, Techno Union, and Corporate Alliance all had their individual security forces operational already. The presence of these security forces had not caused any alarm and actually were sanctioned by the Republic because of the lack of security in the Outer Rim. It's possible what we'll see take place instead of the Clone Wars is a slow-moving Cold War. This benefits Palpatine greatly because it gives the Clone Army time to build up. Remember, in the first few years of the war, it made no sense that the Republic was able to hold its own against the CIS. At the Battle of Geonosis alone, millions of battle droids escaped from the foundries and hundreds of warships. The Republic at the time only had 200,000 clone troopers and was severely outgunned. As a matter of fact, clone troopers who had access to the larger strategic maps of the galaxy in the war were oftentimes puzzled why the CIS then just destroyed the Republic in one fell swoop with their overwhelming numeric advantages. We have to remember also that the Kaminoans were very isolated from the galaxy and most likely they would not have been discovered. They didn't receive representation in the Senate until after the clone army was revealed and their main contact person within the Jedi Order was actually Count Dooku, or Darth Tyrannus as they knew him. And so the Kaminoans could have kept their operations going as long as the initial down payment was paid for, which it was by Higo Damas. While a Cold War situation might give Palpatine more time to react, it would also give the Jedi Order more time to react, which could be a good thing for them as well. The Battle of Geonosis pushed the Jedi Order headfirst into a war that they were woefully unprepared for. Our scenario here gives the Jedi Order more time to prepare for the war and perhaps they would develop better insight on what their role in the galaxy should be. So there you have it guys, that is our analysis of what would happen had Obi-Wan Kenobi not stumbled upon the clone army uh, on that fateful day. Let me know in the comment section below what you think about our analysis. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.